Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? All right. I'm excited to be up here and to give the fourth of uh, messages focusing on the fundamentals. I want to give um, thanks to Pastor Arrington for giving me the opportunity to come up and share. And always want to acknowledge Bishop Harvey, even though he may not always be here, but he gives the apostolic covering for this fellowship. So let's start off in prayer. Father, I thank you that you are here, Lord God. Thank you, Father, for the praise and worship team that ushered in your presence, Lord, and just removed every hindrance, Lord. So I don't even have to pray about that right now, but I just pray right now that your word will go forth not just like a sharp sword. In some cases, Lord, it would need to be like a hammer to knock down walls. Or it would need to be like fire, Lord God, that Jeremiah spoke of, that would burn away veils that cover hearts. But whatever it needs to be, Lord God, let it be what you want it to be towards each individual, Lord. We thank you for this, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So my assignment is to speak about God's rest. Three weeks ago, Pastor Connie spoke about the importance of having a desire in order for faith in God and faith in his word to be effective in the life of a believer. And over these past two weeks, Bishop Harvey has been sharing messages on the basic tenets or the fundamentals of what it means for us as born-again believers to stand on and the importance of discipleship. So I'm going to speak about God's rest. And up behind you uh, on the next slide, you'll see the definition of rest, just so that we know that all, we're all on the same page. And we get this principle of God's rest uh, of taking one day out of seven uh, from his word. And what I'm going to highlight here is not so much a period of time, but a state of being. So I'll ask you the first question. Who was the first person in the Bible to rest? God, right? Yes, it was God himself. So we're going to look at Genesis chapter 2 and look at the first two verses. I'm going to show you something that maybe some of you may not have noticed before. It says in verse 2, it says, On the seventh day God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had done. Verse 3 says, then God blessed the seventh day, sanctified because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Notice in verse 2, it says that God rested on the seventh day. That just tells you when God did it. But then notice what, it, what happens in verse 3. He says that God rested in it. This is what he did with it. So by resting in the seventh day, guess what happened? He made it blessed and sanctified. So if God rested in the sixth day or the third day, the same thing would have happened to those days. But it's his presence that blesses and sanctifies anything and anyone. Understand that God desires to place himself inside people. He wants to put himself in us to bring sanctification, to bring blessing, to bring his rest. That's why he desires to dwell in us. You see, he puts us in Christ so that we are blessed and sanctified, which, all, which only means that we're set, up, set apart for sacred use, for a holy purpose. But we will learn that it is how much we give him room in our lives that helps us to see that we're blessed. We're set apart, and it determines how much we will experience the God kind of rest that I'm going to teach you on. So my assignment, again, is going to come from a very familiar passage of Scripture, and I'm going to uncover some things in that passage. And this message is going to be given in two parts. The first part, I'm going to speak to those of us who are listening who are not yet in the kingdom of God, who are not yet a part of God's family, who are not yet born again. And then second, I'm going to speak to you, my brothers and sisters, whether online or whether here, uh, about what God wants me to share with you. 
So the next passage of scripture is Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. We're very familiar with this, and I'm going to read it out to you. It says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So as I go through this teaching, I'm going to show you that verse 28 is actually an invitation to the lost. Pastor Jeff didn't know this, but he was stealing the first part of my message with that prayer. But I take that as a confirmation that God wanted me to share this part. Amen. Amen. So in your Bible or on your app, I want you to look at verse 28 and highlight or underline the word give. And then in verse 29, which is actually a call to a deeper walk with God, I want you to highlight or underline the word find. So in verse 28, we see that Jesus is actually giving a call out to everyone who's out there, everyone who's toiling, everyone who's getting tired, everyone who's getting beat up by what life throws their way. All that it loads you down with day by day or season after season. We're talking about weights of the past. We're talking about traumas and disappointments, betrayals and failures. All of us have had these. All of us. This is Jesus' call out to you who are trying to do life all by yourself. Some of us have had very difficult lives. We come out of broken families. We've been victims of broken relationships. We've been let down. There have been broken promises in our lives. We've lost family members. We've lost money. We've lost jobs. Some of us have lost our hopes and our dreams. And life can be so unfair. It can be so hard. It sometimes seems to throw more disappointments and defeats at us than it brings victories or successes to us. But again, I say we were never designed to do life on our own. We were created by God. He created this whole universe. He created the earth. He created us. In Revelation 4.11, it says, The Lord is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. This is what we were praising him for because he created everything. And he did it because he wanted to. Bishop Harvey had shared about the great divide between human beings and God. And it's because we're all born with a sin nature. And there's nothing that we can do on our own to get rid of this sin nature. Nothing we can do to get rid of the guilt that comes with it. In Micah 6, 7, it says, now this is using an Old Testament way of how people will come to deal with their sin. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? You know, that's a rhetorical question. Of course the answer is no. And Jesus said in Matthew 16 and 26, he says, What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Again, the answer is, there's nothing. God is the creator of the universe. He's the one we're going to eventually stand before and give an account to our lives, of our lives to him. But this God is completely holy. And all that means is he's perfect, he's pure, he's flawless. There's no sin in him. There's no darkness. There's no shadow in him. And he does not tolerate the presence of sin. Many people come to church or listen online on Sundays just to ease their conscience, thinking that this would make things okay between them and this holy, perfect, and powerful God. They forget that he sees everything around them, and in them even to their deepest, most secret thoughts. Some people like to think of God as just being merciful and gracious. And you know, it's true. He is a merciful and gracious God. He's always looking for those who don't yet know him to come to him, but come to him his way. 
so that things can be made right between him and them. This is the reason why he sent his son Jesus to earth. But many just want God's grace and mercy. But, none as, but not as many want to hear or listen to God's truth. The Bible says that Jesus is not just full of grace, but he's also full of truth. This is what is said in John uh, chapter 1, verses 14 and 17. I'm just going to say these, uh, these scriptures. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. How many of you remember the movie with um, Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson called A Few Good Men? Do you remember when they were in the courtroom and, he, and Jack Nicholson is on the witness stand and Tom Cruise is the lawyer, you know, interrogating him, just trying to get him all riled up, and he gets him riled up. And what does Jack Nicholson say when he's walking away? He says, you can handle the truth, right? Do you know why Jesus Christ came with grace first and then truth? It's not that one is more important than the other. Do you know that if God just gave you the truth, you'd be devastated? But God gives grace, and grace is, it's really God's power to do things that you can't do on your own. So what God does, what Jesus does, he puts grace there to hold you steady. Because when the truth comes at you, you couldn't handle it. So let me just give you some examples of truth that people don't like to hear. Romans 3 and 10 says it's written, no one's righteous. No, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Jesus said this in Matthew 7.21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus gave another example in Luke chapter 13, verses 2 to 5. He's talking, of, he begins this scripture talking about a bunch of Galileans who were at the temple worshiping and were slaughtered by Pilate. He said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's Jesus talking. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. And unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This is what we'd rather hear. This is, we'd like to hear John 3, 16 and 17. And you can say this with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's our, you know, everybody likes to say that. But there's a verse 18, 19, 20, 21. So this is the part we don't like to hear. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and light is a symbol of truth. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, does not want to come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. To those people who only want to come to God on their own terms, the Bible is telling us how misguided you are, how dangerous, how tragic that decision would be. Because many people just want a God that they can manage and that they can handle on their own. They want a God with whom they can feel comfortable according to their own thinking. But he's not a God who will adjust himself for anybody. He's not a God that you can fit in your pocket and pull out when he's convenient. 
He's not a God that you can compress and fit into your small brain. Because he says in his word, this is in Malachi 3, 6, I am God and I do not change. And in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Because since Adam and Eve rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden, we have this sin nature. It's just how it is. So stop fussing over that. I always like to say that if I was in the Garden of Eden with my wife, I probably would have beat him to the punch messing up. So this means the last thing that we want to do is what God wants us to do. We're rebels. We're born enemies. We're separated. And so what's God's solution? It's putting our faith and our trust in who Jesus is and what he has done. This is what Pastor Needfeld was just talking about. So to those of you who have not yet put your faith and trust in Jesus for your salvation, understand this. God sees you where you are. And if you choose to continue to reject his office of mercy, his pleas for, for coming to him for salvation, I'm going to show you all he can give you is his justice. Look at the next slide in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. This, the background to this is Moses had been up on the mountain for about 40 days. Somewhere during that time. And during the conversation he had with him, he asked God, Lord, show me your glory. It's interesting how God responded. God said, I'm going to show you my goodness. And I'm going to make it pass before you. So the time comes. And this is what happens in verse 6. And the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God. Now these are the things that we like to hear about God. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. We'd like to stop there. But look what the last part says. And by no means clearing the guilty. And remember, if you don't have your faith and trust in Jesus, you're already guilty. Because God calls things as he sees them, because God is truth. And it takes repentance, as Pastor Jeff had said, a change in our minds where we come into agreement with the Lord. And this is what you have to understand. God is not going to violate your free will. He's made you in his image, and he respects that. This means you get to make your own choice. But understand this. Just like heaven is forever, hell and the lake of fire are also eternal. Understand this also. From the day you came into existence, you will never, ever stop existing. You also are an eternal being. So you're going to decide whether you're going to be forever in heaven with the Lord. You decide if you will end up in a hell or in the lake of fire that God only originally created for Satan and his angels. There's no purgatory. There's no second chance. The Bible in Hebrews chapter 9, 27 says, it's appointed unto men to die once, and then after that, the judgment. So you need to make a decision. So let's say that at the end of this message, you decide to give your life to Jesus Christ. You believe the truth of what the Bible says about him and about your spiritual condition. You feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit and you want to give your life to the Lord. You do this by repenting. This means you deliberately change your mind from putting your back to God and you bring yourself face to face with God. But you do it with everything that's inside of you. When you do that, you become born again. You become alive. He makes you a new creation on the inside. But here's another caution. God is not a God who will just settle for having a piece of you on a Sunday morning or Wednesday afternoon. The God I speak of, the God of the Bible, is looking for a relationship where he has us all the time. Did you know that jealous is one of the names of God? That's found in Exodus 34, 14. 
That's one of his names. He's not a God who's willing to share his space with anybody or anything. We, I'm talking about our hearts, our minds, and our bodies, are supposed to be that space for him. We were created always to be in communion with him, and we were created to be indwelt by him just like that seventh day. Remember that seventh day at the beginning? He wants us to be rested, blessed, and sanctified. So in Matthew 28, where Jesus says, I will give you rest, this is that first level of rest. This is that first decision line that a person needs to make to be in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Here is where we experience Jesus Christ under the title of Savior. This is a rest that is automatically given. This is what happens when we're saved. It's a total work of grace. It's a gift. That's why preachers call it the gift of salvation. Ephesians uh, 2, 8, 9 just reinforced it. It says, by grace we've been saved through faith. And that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So if you made that decision, you've crossed the first line. You acknowledge you're a sinner. You are in agreement that you need a savior. You have received salvation from sin. But I'm going to make this transition from here to speaking to my brothers and sisters in a second. I want to just highlight an Old Testament analogy of the Israelites that were rescued from Egypt. We know the story that they were enslaved for about 400 years in Egypt. And then when the time for the exodus came, they were supposed to apply the blood of an innocent lamb to the lintel and the doorposts. That was them acting out the symbol of what we do in our hearts, where we believe that Jesus Christ shed his blood for us. And we hear about how God set them free, free from uh, the Egyptian pharaoh and his armies and the taskmasters by drowning them all in the Red Sea. So it was God's intention to get them past that first line. That was their salvation. And there was a wilderness between Egypt and the Promised Land. And that was just God's first thought towards them. He didn't have any, any plans just to leave them after that first line in the desert. So now I'm shifting gears to talk to my brothers and sisters. Many believers are stuck in the wilderness. They're saved, but they're in the wilderness. They're like the first generation who always wanted God to do things their way. They were complainers. They refuse to trust and obey him. They want a God of convenience. How that first generation reads in the Bible is symbolic of those kinds of Christians that are alive today. They only want to come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. I'm telling you, there are some people who just come to Christ just wanting only to be saved. And in other words, all they want is convenient fire insurance. You know, the thief on the cross only got to know Jesus Christ as Savior before he died. That's in Luke chapter 23, verses 42 and 43. You could say he got his fire insurance and he put his policy right into effect, right? But who wants to live like that? There is a second line that God wants to get save people to. After crossing the first line and being set free from Egypt, through the Red Sea, God was determined to get them to the border of Canaan. So this second line is, is all about Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. He says, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. So two things I want to point out there. This is where we find this second level of rest. This level of rest is not automatically given like salvation, but it is found. That means it's discovered. Notice which part of us that experiences this rest. He's not talking about our bodies. He's not talking about our spirits. He's talking about our souls. He's talking about our minds, our emotions, and our will. 
Because when God put us together, he made us into three parts, but they're all supposed to work together in a certain way. We are tripartite beings. We are spirit beings that have a soul enclosed or functioning through a physical body. This is how you should think about ourselves. So before the, the fall of Adam and Eve, they functioned, Adam and Eve functioned spirit, soul, body. But after the fall, the spirit was disconnected from God. The spirit died to God. And guess what happened? The soul took center stage. The soul began trying to do life without God and according to uh, the way it wanted to work. So you end up having a mind functioning by what the mind could understand, what the mind could figure out about the emotions, what felt right to that person, about the will, what that person felt like doing rather than what God had created them to do. Because our mind is our intellect, it's our thought life. And it's constantly racing without God, trying to figure out things on its own. Our will is our ability to make our own decisions. And some of us are just plain stubborn. Some of us won't listen to reason or wisdom or truth until we're body slammed flat on our backs. And then we want to pay attention. Our emotions can go crazy. Some people's emotions go crazy just driving from home to work. Some people make it, they may not get upset with the drive, but they go to work and they can't get along with the boss, they can't get along with the coworkers. Some people can make it through the drive, both to work and they make it through work, but then they come home and the people that they love, they don't like. You know, they're anxious, they're depressed, they're worried because they're trying to do things the wrong way. You know, Brothers and sisters, wouldn't it be great that when we all instantly got born again, that God perfectly realigned us so that we functioned the way Adam and Eve functioned before they fell? But for God, it's a process with us. That's how he's chosen to do it. A little by little, a little here, a little there. So we experience this second level of rest when we obediently enter into the service for the Lord and we discover or find it when we obey what he says. And what this involves is taking his yoke on our shoulders. So let's uh, bring up uh, the yoke slide. The yoke speaks of submission. It talks about his lordship. Luke 6, 46 uh, says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? In other words, if you're going to call Jesus Lord, you better do what he says. So that's the first point. The second point of the yoke means cooperation, which speaks about side-by-side -side functioning. Amos 3.3 says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? And you, after Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, Mark 16.20 says and that the disciples went out and preached everywhere with the Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs. The third point responsibility. We're called to own what God puts on our shoulders because we agreed to do those things that he called us to do. In other words, we have to be found faithful. Apostle Paul told his spiritual son Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and 5, to do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Be found faithful. And the fourth point of bearing the yoke of the Lord is communion. Common union, because it's a yoke for two. Second Corinthians talks about how this is supposed to function in the Godhead for us. It says uh, in, verses, uh, in chapter 13, verse 14, Second Corinthians, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's his strength working in us. And the love of God, that's the motivation that's supposed to drive us. And the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. That's how it's supposed to work for us. So it doesn't sound strange that God's idea of rest is completely different from what we would expect in our natural thinking. You know, we can't do anything of any good or eternal value without being yoked to Jesus Christ. 
And once we enter the kingdom of God, we're called to serve. You know, God has his own welfare system. It's all about his children working in his name in the character of Christ for the faring well or the welfare of others, not self. Just like Jesus said in Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served. So this second level of rest, in this second level of rest, we begin to experience Jesus Christ as Lord. But I want to bring up some cautionary concerns. There are so many believers who are stuck. You can bring up the slide about stuck Christians. They're stuck between the line of salvation and the line of submission. The line of salvation got them out of Egypt, got them saved. The line of submission is getting them where God wanted them to be in the land of promise, in the land of rest, in the land of Canaan. They're stuck there. They're no longer in Egypt, but they're not even in the promised land. Let me tell you what, how the Holy Spirit felt about it in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. And as I read this, you can sense how frustrated the Holy Spirit was with them. It says, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, that sounds kind of harsh, right? Why wouldn't God just go ahead and take them into Canaan, into the land of promise? Well, understand, God had designed for them to go in there and get rid of all the sinful nations that were there. And if they had the same sinful attitude, they would probably add to the sin in that nation, you know, in that area. So that's why he wouldn't bring them in. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it reads, Since there is a promise of entering his rest, in other words, crossing that second line, let us fear, in other words, be reverentially attentive, lest any of you seem to come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them. Remember Pastor Connie's message? Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So what happens to these Christians? They will end up wandering around and eventually dying in their desert of rebellion. They just wanted to be saved. They won't allow the Holy Spirit who's living inside of them to shape them into the image of Christ. Instead, they prefer to let their own souls call the shots. They don't choose to trust the Lord Jesus. They don't let the words of life that are in the word of God grow their faith. As a saved person, you can come to church. You can hear the word of God over and over again. But if you never put it into action, if you never obey it, your faith remains tiny. You will never be able to trust God and do what he says when the rubber meets the road, when the difficulties of life come. Because James 2.26 says, faith without works is dead. Our faith cannot grow without the word of God. And guess what? The word of God will do us no good unless we obey it in faith. So let's get back to crossing that second level of rest, crossing that second line. Now, we know that it was the second generation, uh, the generation that followed the first generation that died in the wilderness that crossed into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. But there are some cautionary tales there as well. Did you know that we can stagnate and practice disobedience and rebellion and become complacent in this promised land after crossing that second line? We may not have the same first-generation attitude of just being complainers, but things can still go wrong. You know, we just had the slide up on stock Christians. Now we're going to go to the slide of compromising Christians. Let's look at the example of the Joshua generation, that second generation of Israelites that followed the Lord into the promised land. Yeah, they crossed that line into the second level of rest, but they had been told earlier before Moses died 
Moses told them to wipe out the wicked nations that he that God had judged and to kill all the giants in the land of Canaan. You know, you might be thinking in your mind, hey, 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 wait a minute. This is supposed to be the land of rest. Why are we suiting up for, for a fight? This is the way God does it. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1, this is what God told the Israelites to do through Moses. When the Lord God brings you into the land in which you possess, that you go to possess, and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. He wanted them just to get rid of them because their time of sin had reached their fullness. A couple of generations later, after Joshua and his generation died out, look what happens in Judges chapter 3 and verse 5. Thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Verse 6 talks about them adapting their ways, their lifestyles, and even worshiping their gods. Think about that. That's what it means to be a compromising Christian. Or, here's another uh, precaution. We can give our service for God a higher priority than God himself. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 to 5. This is Jesus talking to the Ephesian church. He says in verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. You've tested those who say that they are apostles and are not. You found them liars, and you have persevered and have patience. You have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Now, by today's standards, that will be considered an on-fire church, right? They're doing all these good things. But look what the priority is for Jesus in verse 4. I have this against you. You've left your first love. Remember, therefore, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. You might say, well, what are the first works? First love, first place. If you don't do the first works, I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. So what does that mean? It means that the church will become useless to him. It won't have his light in him because they don't have him at the forefront. So we don't want to be compromisers. And we also don't want to be believers who only know God just through our service for him. Jesus reminds us to keep him as our first love, keep him as our first love. And when we do that, that means spending time with him every day in prayer and in times of fasting, in studying and in internalizing the word, in worshiping him. And then it doesn't just stop at the time of your devotions. You're supposed to carry him in the front of your mind and in your heart all through your day. That means when you do your daily tasks, you should be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit about how to go about doing that. And you're supposed to do everything according to the principles and the truth that's in God's word. Because Jesus had told them that they had left their first love. So what does it mean to love him? Do you know that God does not separate out love and obedience? John 14 and 21 says, Jesus said, he who has my commandments and keeps them. That's who's loving me. Who cares what you say with your mouth if you don't do it with your life? John 15 and 14 says this, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. And you know, brothers and sisters, that's the third line. That's the line we're aiming for. We're not content just with the first line of salvation. We're not content with just getting into the promised land. Yes, in the promised land, we may have had some victories. We might have followed his leading in driving out the nations, and those nations could be symbolic of sinful habits. We may have killed some giants. Those could be symbolic of the strongholds that were in our lives. We don't want to leave a few giants and nations around. You know, those giants and nations can become those sins that so easily beset us. That's spoken of in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. We don't want to stop. But some of you may be thinking, but Brother, Brother Curran, that might be 
that's just too high an ideal. It's too high a goal. Somebody should have told Apostle Paul that, right? What did he say in Philippians 3, 12, and 14? I haven't attained. I'm not perfect. I press on that I may lay hold on for that which Christ has also laid hold of me. I don't count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind. And I keep reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in God in Christ Jesus. So we were never designed by God to do life without him. Think about it. Before time began, God the Father was doing eternal life with God the Son and with God the Holy Spirit. He always did it in communion. And we're made in God's image, and we're designed to be in union with the Godhead. You know, it should be no surprise to those of us who are born again that people who don't have a relationship with the Lord are stressed. They're messed up with all the crazy stuff that life throws toward them. But I ask you this question, why are so many Christians just as stressed? Why are they so worn out? Why are so many of them ready to give up or give in? Let me tell you why. Many have settled for just crossing that first line, that line that's in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. But don't you understand that that level of rest that was given was never designed to get us through the daily grind of everyday life? It was designed just to get you from going to hell. It was given as a gift, and it's given as a sign to every believer that he or she is now in the kingdom of God and is now a son and daughter of God. It's verse 29, that second level of rest that we go for, that we discover. That's where you find the strength to deal with all the pressures of life successfully. That's where you can deal with life's demands, all the unexpected things. But you know the way that works is you keep Christ first and then you fulfill your mission. That's what we do and that's how we become productive. That's when what we do becomes satisfying. And that's where Jesus Christ truly is Lord. But again, I say this, we're supposed to be aiming for the third line. That's where Jesus will call us his friends. Remember what friends do. Friends know each other in ways that nobody else does. And friends are intensely loyal to one another. That's what Jesus is after. That's the line Jesus is calling us to. So I'm going to pull up my summary slide. This is it in a nutshell. We were created to abide in the full rest of God. And there are three levels. There's salvation. It's a gift. There's submission and service to the Lord. We discover, we find that. And then the push goal is friendship with God. That's also found in obedience. So what is God's rest? It's a state of spiritual peace and confidence, regardless of what the circumstances are. It's the source of our strength and endurance, and it's only found when we're always maintaining an intimate relationship with him. This is why Jesus was so chill all the time. Anytime he wanted to get upset is when he, he saw how his father's house was being managed or when Peter would speak out of turn, right? But he was always just calm. And he did it because he dwelt in the secret place all the time. He spent time, you know, he spent his days before ministry internalizing the word. And everything that the word said about him, he believed. It was really God's journal about his son. He spent time praying. You know, he would always go up in the mountain and pray early in the morning or pray all night. And no one can tell Jesus he didn't know how to fast, right? And Jesus was always faithfully obedient to whatever the father told him to do. Amen? Amen. That's all I have. So, decisions need to be made, brothers and sisters. Decisions. Those of you who don't know the Lord, you need to make a decision.
You don't know what tomorrow holds. People say that all the time. And then you don't want to have that terrible regret when you find out that it's too late. But there are also those of us who are born again who need to cross into that second line. And maybe some of us have crossed that second line and Jesus is asking for complete obedience for that third line. If I can ask the altar counselors to come right now, I want to invite you to come. Some of us may want to rededicate our lives in some way or the other. Others may want to give their life to the Lord. You don't necessarily, those online, you can make where you are an altar. But don't let the word of God not be mixed with faith. And don't let your faith be sold out by being disobedient. Give your life to the Lord. Give all that you are to the Lord. Make yourself as ready as you can be. Because you never know what life's going to bring you away. And while the altar councils are here, I'm just going to pray right now. Father, your word has gone forth, Lord God. You've confirmed your word, Lord. Let it pierce. Let it break down. Let it burn away. Let it be what it needs to be, Lord God. Let it settle. Let it take root, Lord God. You are a great God, Lord God, and you will never change. We are the ones that need to change. We are the ones that need to line up, Lord. As your Holy Spirit just works in our hearts, Lord, as you bring to mind things that you ask us to give up to you so that you can be Lord, as you convict us of our sin and, we, and we're called to give our lives to you, Lord God, do that work. Don't let your word, Lord God, fall to the ground. But let it complete its assignment for today, Father. Lord, I thank you and I bless you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The altars will remain open and I'm going to uh, give a benediction. And then I'll ask Pastor Jason to come up and give us instructions. Bow your heads. The Lord bless and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Father God, lift up your countenance upon us and give us your peace and keep your name on this church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.